Okay. I think we are ready to begin. Um, and as you may have discerned from our playing around with the technology, um, Michaela is unable to be with us in person. She had an unexpected illness earlier in the week that prevented travel uh, across the pond, um, uh, but uh, she was willing to uh, deliver it uh, virtually. And uh, of course, we were happy for her to be able to uh, deliver it. So let me take some time here to contextualize um, the lecture and introduce um, uh, Michaela, and, and then I will turn the floor over to her. So for those who don't know me, I'm Alan Love. I'm director of the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. Um, and what we are doing here today is the biennial Geary Memorial Lecture, a lecture that was endowed by the estate of Ron Geary, who was the director of the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science um, from 1987 to 1996, and a member of the philosophy department faculty here until his retirement in 2006. He passed away in 2020. With this lecture, uh, what we aim to do is uh, spotlight contemporary researchers who are augmenting, extending, and developing uh, certain themes that are uh, close to or kin to uh, Ron's ideas, uh, which he developed over many years, thinking about the role of models in science, the role of different perspectives that scientists take on phenomena, and uh, you will see that reflected in the presentation today. Uh, so the way we will proceed is um, uh, after the lecture, um, there will be a time for Q&A, uh, and so I will come around with the microphone for those who have uh, questions um, uh, for Michaela, um, and then uh, after that, we will adjourn immediately behind you to uh, a reception, uh, so uh, we will be able to do that. Um, unfortunately, Michaela cannot partake of the food and drink uh, through the internet. Um, you might say we don't have the bandwidth for that, but um, uh, uh, such is uh, uh, the, the realities of the situation. Uh, so let me introduce Michaela. It's my great pleasure to introduce Michaela Massimi to deliver the Biennial Geary Memorial Lecture in Philosophy of Science. Professor Massimi is Professor of Philosophy of Science in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Edinburgh and affiliated with the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Royal Astronom uh, Astronomical Society, elected member of the German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina, corresponding member of the Académie Internationale de Philosophie des Sciences, an elected member of the Academy Europea. Professor Massimi was the recipient of the Royal Society's Wilkins Bernal Medal and Lecture in 2017, which is given for excellence in a subject relating to the history of science, philosophy of science, or the social function of science. Her primary research interests are in the philosophy of science, the history and philosophy of modern physics, and Kant's philosophy of nature. Professor Massimi's work is highly interdisciplinary in approaching contemporary philosophical problems by looking both at their historical roots and contemporary scientific practice. She has collaborated on a number of initiatives and written articles and book chapters with colleagues in physics as well as in history. Philosophical topics she has explored include realism, perspectivism and pluralism in science, natural kinds and laws of nature, scientific modeling in particle physics and cosmology, and disagreement in science. More historically, she has investigated the history of the early quantum theory, the legacy of Newtonianism in Kant's philosophy of nature and laws of nature in Kant's system. Professor Massimi's 2022 monograph, Perspectival Realism, which we have been reading in the Center Discussion Group in the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science this semester, received the 2023 Lakatosh Award for an outstanding contribution to the philosophy of science. She has also edited a number of scholarly volumes, including Knowledge from a Human Point of View, Understanding Perspectivism, Scientific Challenges and Methodological Prospects, Kant's Kant and the Laws of Nature, Philosophy and the Sciences for Everyone. 
Professor Massimi is also the author of a number of peer-reviewed journal articles on diverse topics in journals such as Philosophy of Science, British Journal for Philosophy of Science, European Journal for Philosophy of Science, Synthes, uh, Nature Physics, Studies in the History and Philosophy of Modern Physics. From 2015 to 2019, she was vice president of the European Philosophy of Science Association and currently serves as the president of the Philosophy of Science Association. She's the principal investigator on the project Ocean and Us, a Royal Society of Edinburgh Research Network Award in collaboration with the Department of Chemistry and Department of Law at the University of Aberdeen. Her lecture this afternoon is entitled Epistemic Communities and Their Situated Knowledges, an Introduction to Perspectival Realism. In it, she revisits Ron Geary's seminal work on scientific perspectivism from 2006 to ask what a scientific perspective is, how it differs from Kuhn's notion of scientific paradigm, and how it captures the situated knowledge of particular epistemic communities. Additionally, she will clarify the ontology of nature that naturally accompanies the notion of a scientific perspective and its implications for how to think of scientific knowledge as a multicultural inquiry. Please join me in welcoming Professor Massimi to deliver the Biennial Geary Memorial Lecture in Philosophy of Science. Thank you very much, Alan. Can you hear me okay? Is the audio okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Let me know if you can hear me or if there is any echo in the background. So many thanks to Alan for this very kind invitation. And uh, as Alan was saying, uh, it's my deep regret to not being able to be there. I was really uh, planning to come. I went to the airport, but I was not really feeling well. So I had to take the decision to come back home. And I'm just grateful that we were able to um, to do this lecture online as I wouldn't have wanted to, to miss it. Uh, I'm truly, truly honored to be giving this year uh, Ron Giri Memorial Lecture, and in what um, in what follow, I'm going to give my own uh, autobiographical homage to uh, Ron Giri's work and his lasting legacy in our field. I will not attempt to give an overview of Ron the many contributions that straddle really the field of philosophy of science, but also science studies and cognitive sciences. And so inevitably, my memorial lecture is going to be incomplete and it's going to be very idiosyncratic um, in that it will not do justice to the full legacy of Rongiri's work. But I do hope to highlight as I go along aspects of Rongiri's work that had a profound influence on me and many others and shine a light on what I think is the sign of great work in philosophy of science, which Ron gave us. So my first encounter with Ron's work uh, goes back to my graduate times at the London School of Economics, where his book, Science Without Laws, uh, and his agent-based view of scientific representations were classics on which many of us were trained. Uh, but it wasn't really until my postdoc years in Cambridge that I started a kind of more sustained engagement with a number of topics that in a way are behind the wrong year's work on perspectivism. So originally published in 2006, uh, Ron Geary's book on scientific perspectivism had a profound influence on me. I had just started my first job as a lecturer in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at UCL, um, and my former Cambridge mentor, uh, Peter Lipton, um, emailed me with his review of, uh, of Ron's book uh, for the journal Science in May 2007. Peter Lipton knew about my ongoing fascination uh, with Kant and Kuhn, but also Patnam internal realism. And um, in the review, uh, Peter Lipton located Ron Geary's book in a tradition that he saw as beginning with Kant and continuing with Kuhn, a tradition that Peter Lipton called constructivism. And so he sent me the review with the note that he thought I was going to like Ron Geary's book. And he was right. Um, I very much like Rongiri's book, and the book really set me, uh, in a way, in a kind of direction of research that I've been on for 18 years. So I started working on this research topic on and off for a few years, um, while I was also learning the, the, the rope of my new job as a lecturer. And it was not really until 2010 that I started writing on this topic. And it was not until 2014 that my interest in scientific perspectivism really started taking a life of its own. Uh, 
I was very fortunate to meet Ron for my first and what, um, unbeknownst to me at the time, was also going to be the last time in Chicago in 2014 for a, a PSA 2014 symposium that I organized with Ron, Paul Teller, Matsvita Chirimuta, and Sandy Mitchell on the topic of scientific perspectivism. And I believe there was also Ron probably last talk at the Philosophy of Science Association biennial meeting before retiring from public life in the last few years of his life. And our symposium in Chicago in 2014 provided a wonderful opportunity for all of us to engage with Ron's work. And we celebrated the end of the symposium in a trattoria in Chicago that Ron uh, very much loved. So when I was preparing for this lecture, I went to dig into my file and uh, I was able to locate Bashir Lak, uh, Ron's slide for the 2014, which I had saved on my laptop. That's what happened when you know you give your laptop before <laughs> presenting and then years later, you're able to locate other people's slides on it. And so I want to start with them to show how my work over the past decade has been really an attempt at continuing some of the intellectual conversation that um, Ron and I left in the Trattoria in Chicago back in 2014. So this is the title of Ron Giri last talk at the PSA biennial meeting in Chicago in 2014. And as the title indicates, Ron was at the time, I think, toying with the idea of expanding his original scientific perspectivism beyond the original domain of science by really putting forward the idea that perspectivism broadly understood is, quote, the doctrine that all claims are relative to or are conditional upon or presuppose a perspective. And in the rest of the talk, Ron went back to his 2006 book and his preferred notion of what a perspective was, namely a hierarchy or model, uh, where uh, principal models are at the top and models of the experiments and models of the data are at the bottom. And the idea is that those two directions would meet halfway into what uh, Ron called the specific hypothesis and generalization concerning the fit between representational models, for example, a model of the pendulum and Newtonian mechanics and models of the data. In this sense, Ron used to speak of the Newtonian perspective or the Maxwellian perspectives as families or hierarchies or models. His model-based perspectivism had some far-reaching consequences. So for example, it forced us to rethink the relationship between scientific theories and reality in a way that sidestep some of the classical debate on scientific realism. And unsurprisingly, Ron, the next slide for the PSA 2014 symposium, pitted the view that he called the perspective of realism against traditional realism. On this view, instead of asking whether, uh, for example, the Newtonian module of the pendulum is true of the real system, Giri would invite us to ask whether the Newtonian model of the pendulum would have a good fit with the models of the experiment and data models within the Newtonian perspective. And Ron, last slide, concluded as follows, quote, a half century ago, Thomas Kuhn argued that all scientific claims are relative to a paradigm. The vast majority of philosophers of science rejected this view as dangerously relativistic. Kuhn was basically right. Unfortunately, his own conceptual world didn't allow the possibility that realism could be perspectival. Ron had always seen, I think, his work on scientific perspectivism as continuing in the footstep of Thomas Kuhn. Uh, he published an article in Topoi 2013 as, on Kuhn as perspectival realist, and ultimately wanted to defend a broadly Kuhnian view Problem with it, as he saw it, was that Kuhn himself had been fighting against the charge of relativism. And given Peter Lipton's review of uh, Ron Geary's book, Ron's own brand of perspectivism was encountering a similar fate. It was precisely this key question that got me into the topic. Can one be a perspectivist and a realist at the same time? Can the what I'm going to call the Kuhnian slash Girian intuition be reconciled with the realist one. So by realist intuition, what I mean is roughly the idea that science tells us an approximately true story about nature. And by the Kuhnian slash Girian intuition, 
I mean, the claim that scientific knowledge is always within the boundaries of a scientific paradigm or within a scientific perspective. Um, like our observation of the Trifin Nebula, for example, is always within the boundaries of particular instrumental technique, as Ron Geary explained in his 2006 book. Now, stated this way, the question seemed to me intractable at the time. And sometimes what gets us into a topic is not the rosy prospect of some easily demonstrable conclusion, but rather the imperviousness of the question itself. So Ron left me with a thorny question to grapple, a question about how to reconcile perspectivism and realism, or indeed why such reconciliation is even desirable to start with. And I'm not sure I've myself been able to answer this question in a fully satisfactory way. Some of my critics would argue that such a rapprochement continues to remain difficult. And yet I'd like to think that the sign of great work in philosophy of science and other fields where a lasting legacy like that of Ron Giri can be found is not necessarily to display the surgical exactitude with which we sometimes might like to finish a jigsaw puzzle, like finding the last missing piece of the jigsaw. Lasting legacy can be found in work whose margins are fuzzy and research questions open-ended so as to give other people the opportunities to explore new avenues. So sometimes I tell the student that I'd like to think of philosophical work really not as a jigsaw puzzle solving, but as a game of Carcassonne, I don't know whether you're familiar with that game, which can go on and on and on and expand in different directions and unforeseeable ways. So my intellectual debt to Ron Giri is to have started, so to speak, a game of Carcassonne about how to reconcile re realism and perspectivism. And this is a game which I've enjoyed playing for a long time and with me, several others that have contributed to these questions. And so in what follow really in the remaining of this, uh, of this talk today, I will briefly chart the direction that I've been taking myself in addressing these open-ended questions with gratitude to Ron Giri for having made these intellectual explorations possible in the first instance. My own personal journey through this open-ended question started uh, actually with a challenge to Rongiri, uh, which was clearly laid out by two other philosophers to whom I owe an intellectual debt, Margie Morrison and Anjan Chakravarti. In a 2010 paper on nuclear models, then and again in a 2015 book, Reconstructing Reality, Margie Morrison argued that there was no genuine ground for perspectival realism. Looking at the history of nuclear models, Mor Morrison remarked how physicists routinely use different models for nuclear phenomena. So they use the liquid drop model for nuclear fission, the shell model for isotopic stability, the cluster model for stellar nucleosynthesis, and the quark model for adronization. Morrison gave a very sobering assessment of the situation. That's what she said in her 2015 book. So as perspectivism is the view that from the perspective of theory T, model M represent system S in a particular way. While this sounds like an appealing way to address the problem of inconsistent models, some nagging, remain, some nagging worries remain. In particular, how we should answer the general question is model M an accurate representation of system S? Epistemically, it's not clear that anything significant follows from this. For example, there's only one nucleus, but if we say that from perspective X, it looks like Y, and from perspective A, it looks like B, we are no farther ahead in finding out its real nature. A similar assessment came from Anjan Chakravarti, who also concluded, quote, that the motivation for resisting perspectivism is to uphold the possibility and indeed the likelihood of scientific knowledge that is epistemically sound across perspectives, thereby resisting the relativistic thesis that different perspectives inevitably yield irreducibly incompatible claims to knowledge. Giri perspectivism to the eyes of Morrison and Chakravarti was closer to relativism, maybe a form of aletic relativism, truth being relative to perspectives rather than to realism. And this objection really got me thinking and somehow set me on my own, so to speak, a game of Carcassonne, where for a long time I was really trying to 
think of how the insight of perspectivism could in fact be made compatible with realism in science, or at least with some suitable reinterpretation of realism. So in reply to Morrison's worry, I ended up developing a, a way of thinking about uh, how to reconcile perspectivism and realism in my book. And I engage with a case study of nuclear models around 1950s, among other case studies, to show that the role was not to offer a de rare representation of relevant essential features of the target system. In other words, the role of these models and perspectival models more in general is not to offer a one-to-one -one mapping between features of the model and features of the target system. They play instead an exploratory role. They allow the nuclear physicists to gain knowledge of the nuclear structure at the time, back in the 1930s, when neutrons had just been discovered, speculation abounded about whether the nucleus might consist of alpha particles, quantum chromodynamics had not been discovered yet. The exploratory nature of the nuclear models in the uh, decades between 1930s and 1950 is rooted in their historical evolution in response to new data becoming available over time and new phenomena being inferred from those data over time. So I came to think that those models were not perspectival in the sense of representing the nucleus from different points of view, as we would imagine in some colloquial terms. But they offer instead perspectival representation in opening up a window on reality, on the reality of the nuclear structure, despite partial, limited, and inevitably piecemeal epistemic access to it. And that got me thinking about what's really at stake whenever we talk about how models represent the target system and the perspectival nature of the representation that they afford. Think of what it means for a representation to be perspectival. You might reply that a representation in art or in science is perspectival because it's drawn from a particular vantage point. So the interior of the landscape is represented as drawn from a particular angle where you can see some objects more prominently than others. But a representation can also be said to be perspectival because it's drawn towards one or more vanishing points. And in fact, these two ways of thinking about what makes a representation perspectival are two sides of the same coin. It's because the representation has one or more vanishing points that it appears to be drawn from a particular point of view. There doesn't have to be a tension between these two ways of thinking about what makes a representation perspectival. They're clearly compatible. Any representation can be said to be perspectival both because it's drawn from a particular vantage point and because it's directed towards one or more vanishing points. However, it is the emphasis that we place on one of these two ways of thinking about the perspectival nature of representation that has philosophically far-reaching consequences. Because the first notion stresses the situatedness of the representation, whereas the second stresses its directionality. So in my book, uh, in chapter 4a, I delved into a number of models for the nucleus that were available in the 1930s, 50s and their complex interplays and why they are a good example of what I'm going to call uh, perspectival models, from gamma liquid drop model to Bohr compound model, from Catherine Way or particle model to Ancient and Maria Gopermeyer 1948 shell model, which eventually was awarded Nobel Prize for Physics. Maria Gopermeyer was the second woman to receive the Nobel Prize after Marie Curie. So in analogy with perspective in art, I argue that this model delivers knowledge of what is possible about the nucleus, about its internal structure, its isotopic stability, nuclear potential, and rotational spectra, and the range of possible combinations of protons and neutrons. And so it, we use those models, not because we want to map into features of the target systems that sits on some kind of silver plate in front of us, but we build those models because we want to ask questions about how things could be. So we want to ask questions about could alpha particle radioactive chain end with the element allium rather than the element lead? And the answer to the question is no, because once you have the shell model, you know that 
there are magic numbers in which protons and neutrons sit in those orbitals, and 82 is a magic number in a way that 81 isn't. Or you could ask whether there could be nature or there could be artificially produced a nucleus, like a particular isotope of the atom of hydrogen with a particular atomic weight. And the answer in this case is no, because it would fall out of the drip line of the energy valley. Again, an information that the shell model of the nucleus tell us. Or you could ask whether there could be a very short-lived nuclei with a very large neutron excess along the neutron drip line. And the answer to the question is yes, there could be such nuclei. A large investment have gone into searching for them. So as I came to see this question then, to be a perspectival realist, about the atomic nucleus is to engage with an open-ended series of uh, morally robust phenomena like nuclear stability, neutron capture, nuclear rotational spectral at the experimental level. And with the many exploratory models, they over time allowed physicists to gain knowledge about what is possible about those phenomena. And so perspectival model of the nucleus were exploratory in enabling a variety of communities to make relevant and appropriate inferences about the nucleus. They allow the exploration of uh, uh, a nuclear structure by acting as inferential blueprint. And so what I mean by inferential blueprints, it's a notion that I elaborated in chapter five of my work, is that they allowed the different communities over time to make inferences from a range of data set to what I call morally robust phenomena. And so this is the philosophical idea that I unpack on uh, chapter five of my book, namely the perspectival model, model possibility by acting as inferential blueprints to support a particular kind of conditionals, indicative conditionals with suppositional antecedent. So let me give you the following analogy with architectural blueprints, which like the one in the picture here, mark a turning point in the history of architecture and cartography because they made it easy to go through various iterations of the same design, introduce changes and tweaks and so forth. There are a number of elements at play in this analogy. So first of all, blueprints are perspectival representations. Each represent the target system, so in this case it was a building, from a specific vantage point. But when taken together, a collection of blueprints offer a plurality of points of view from above, from below, from the rear, for opening up a window on reality, namely how the final building is going to look like. The perspective of representation of the blueprint is distorted. Blueprints are also the starting point of collaborative effort to implement the original design. So they show what different communities can do with perspectival representation and how they can use them. And blueprints act as inferential tools. A blueprint is a medium for perspectival representation of a given building. It facilitates different communities to exchange instructions over time and make relevant and appropriate inferences. Likewise, one can say that perspectival models, like models of the nucleus, um, offer perspective representation of the target system. That representation is also in this case distorted and perspectival models are also collaborative efforts of several epistemic communities and evolve over time with new additions and new tweaks. And as blueprints make possible for carpenters and joiners and mason to make relevant and appropriate inferences about to say the house to be built, Perspectival models allow different epistemic communities to come together and make the relevant and appropriate inferences about the target system. So going back to Rongiri, seminal work on scientific perspectives, in my effort to answer some of the objections that were leveled against Rongiri's view, I ended up rethinking entirely not only how scientific models function as inferential blueprints to make inferences about phenomena, but more broadly, I had to rethink what's at stake in the notion of scientific perspective over and above a hierarchy of models. And I came to see a perspective as something much broader in scope than a hierarchy of models, and something which is effectively to be identified with what I call the historically and culturally situated practice of a scientific community at historical time. So here the influence of feminist philosophy of science and of the situated knowledge thesis played an important role for my intellectual journey. 
And I'm thinking here of the works by Sandra Harding, Don Haraway, Arzo, Helen Longino, Alison Wally, and many others. So I came to understand that the situatedness of the scientific practice in terms of not just the body of claims of knowledge, which at any point in time a community may advance, but also in terms of the experimental, theoretical and technological resources that the community has available to make those claims of knowledge, and in terms of what are called the methodological epistemic principles that justify the reliability of those claims of knowledge. So in this context, it seemed to me important to clarify that the situated knowledge captured by any scientific perspective was not equated with enrolling into a particular community at the exclusion of others. For example, I think it would be wrong to identify what one might call the Faraday-Maxwell perspective with some kind of shared membership of some field theoretic assumption or modeling practices which were the exclusive intellectual repository of the Cavendish lab in Victorian Cambridge. Doing so would lose sight of the broader historical context in which the perspective became possible and eventually thrived. It would, for example, unjustly cut out other epistemic communities, I'm thinking here of Scottish kelp makers, local glassware artisan and glass blowers, was practices in producing cathode ray tubes, for example, were important enabling factors behind the Faraday-Maxwell perspective in which, for example, J.J. Thompson work on cathode rays and eventually the discovery of the electron took place. The assumption of insulated scientific perspective, uh, which I resist in the book, I think is a remnant of what uh, I'm going to call Kuhnian communitarianism, so the idea that scientific knowledge is defined by the specific membership of particular communities sharing what the early Kuhn called a paradigm. So if you remember Cunha Normal Science, Cunha Normal Science is defined by canonical texts. So it could be the Almagest for Ptolemaic astronomy or the Principia for Newton, uh, Newtonian mechanics. Within those texts, generations of students learn scientific terms and laws of nature. And this is how, according to uh, this Kuhnian communitarianism, scientific knowledge get passed on from one generation to the next that belong to the same scientific paradigms in periods of normal science. Until the time comes when anomalies accumulate, trigger a crisis, and a new paradigm comes to the fore. But perspective realism, as I'd like to think of it, rejects the philosophical assumption that the science evolves via membership of any particular well-insulated scientific perspective or paradigm. This is something that I think historians of science have long rediscovered with their kaleidoscopic approach to science and increasing emphasis on material culture. Because as soon as the attention shifts away from scientific theories to material culture, or in my language, the perspectival modeling, including all the technique, experimental and technological one available to community to make claims of knowledge, the pluralistic and fluid nature of scientific perspectives become evident. Pace, Kuhnian, communitarianism, scientific knowledge travels across culture and is inherently cosmopolitan, where by cosmopolitanism, in the way I'm using the word, I don't mean anything remotely close to globalization or integration of perspectives or melting or merging, overlapping, hybridizing historical and culturally situated perspectives with all the troublesome consequences which are implicit in those expressions. Instead, when seen through the lenses of perspective of realism, scientific knowledge is never the prerogative of a single community at one historical moment in time. It is social and collective in a distinctively multicultural and cosmopolitan way, where the emphasis is on the plurality of phenomena rather than discovering well-defined sets of properties or pre-carved natural kinds. So as it were, this was indeed one of the my two main motivations behind the perspective of realism as a project in the epistemology of science. So the first one was really historical. So I wanted to write a book on perspective of realism because I've always really thought that 
um, whenever we have an epistemic stance about science, realism, instrumentalism, empiricism, or similar, we should be able to speak to the history of science and we should be able to really take seriously the historically situated nature of, of our knowledge. But the second and related motivation for, for the book and for the project uh, as it took shape has to do with what in the book I refer to very loosely uh, as multiculturalism. And I'm aware that the term has a very different meanings in different areas, especially political theory, for example, which is not the way in which I'm using the term here. So debates on realism in science and scientific knowledge have had a tendency somehow to proceed in some kind of engineered cultural vac vacuum. So they somehow very often hide the presumption that scientific knowledge is produced out of context or uh, not in a well-defined historical cultural context that inevitably affects the kind of knowledge that any community can afford at a particular point in time. And so one of my main motivations for developing perspective of realism was really an attempt to counteract that presumption and rediscover this multicultural nature of scientific knowledge. And this implied reassessing uh, the role played by a great number of historically and culturally situated communities in knowledge production, especially those communities that are often cut off or severed by epistemological narratives. So I'm thinking of local knowledge about the flora among beekeepers in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is something I discussed in chapter eight of my book, or knowledge of the Rosy Periwinkle in the community of South Madagascar, which I discussed in chapter 11, or knowledge about kelp making, producing ashes from seaweed that were used in glass manufacture by the Scottish Hebridean communities of the 18th and early 19th century, which was important for electromagnetic researches which I discussed in chapter 10 of my book. And so throughout my book, I urge us not to think of scientific perspective as shared membership or isolated kind of silo, but as historically interlacing and stretching beyond the specific geopolitical and national boundaries. So I use these two terms in the book. I say the scientific perspective intersect and interlace. And so just to clarify what I mean by it, Intersecting is a methodological features of how scientific perspectives can be brought to bear on one another to refine and improve the reliability of claims of knowledge. Interlacing is a historical feature. It refers to how situated perspectives have encountered uh, and traded with one another some of their tools, instruments, and technique in what I call a historical lineage. And so when seen through the lenses of perspectival realism, scientific knowledge is social and collective in a distinctive multicultural and historical way. And so to kind of give a, a view at a glance of perspectival realism, as I came to say it in, as a project in the epistemology of science, I think perspectival realism serves two main important functions. From an epistemic standpoint, it reinstates epistemic communities that have been culturally, socially, historically severed from epistemological narratives about who produces knowledge or what to benefit from scientific knowledge. And from a normative standpoint, it makes the case as to why scientific knowledge is multicultural, it is knowledge that pertains to a variety of culturally situated epistemic communities. So to return once again to the impervious question of how to reconcile perspectivism and realism, here are some of the meta metaphysical details of how I came to answer that specific question in the book. So my view places phenomena center stage when it comes to the ontological commitment for perspectival realism. So phenomena for a long time have been regarded as uh, really no match for realist uh, ontology and they've been regarded as stronghold of the empiricist tradition. So in the book, I had to rethink the notion of phenomena and this is the definition that I adopted in chapter six of the book. I say phenomena are stable events indexed to a particular domain depending on the context of inquiry and modally robust across a variety of perspectival data to phenomena inferences. So phenomena are stable event that can be recognized across a swarm of data, across different data to phenomena inferences. And the phenomenon, as I said, is a stable, the bustability, I mean, low-like event 
Whose occurrence can be inferred in many different possible ways. So I see stability going hand in hand with model robustness, and the two come together in a, some sort of two-tier model view, where low likeness is a primitive property of stable events in nature, whereas uh, um, there's a second tier modality at play in perspectival ontology, which is what I call the model robustness of the phenomena as an epistemic kind of modality. And so model robustness expresses the ways in which epistemic communities may infer or reinfer the same phenomenon by connecting often different pieces of evidence, different data sets to the stable event in question. And this is where the inferential and perspectival aspect of my definition of phenomena becomes salient. So the model robustness of phenomena can be regarded as a secondary quality because it really depends on our epistemic communities that occupy a particular scientific perspective, relate a variety of data sets to a stable event in question within the inferential boundaries of their situated knowledge, uh, including, as I said, experimental technique, technological tool modeling practices. Now, all those are subject to change over time, and this is what makes knowledge situated and perspectival. By contrast, the occurrence of stable qualolac event is irrespective of the particular perspectival pluralism that human beings have historically developed. And so this is the realist, what I call the realist tether in the perspectival realist ontology. However, what makes a stable event a phenomenon does depend, as I said, on a range of epistemic communities and their inferential tools. So that the negative electric charge is repelled by a magnetic field is a stable event in nature, whose low like occurrence is independent of J.J. Thompson or the situated knowledge of Victorian Cambridge. However, that the occurrence of such an event, an associated one, like for example, electrical ions in water, could be robustly inferred in many different ways, is dependent on the situated knowledge of particular communities at particular historical times. And this example is dependent, among other things, on knowledge about kelp making, glass blowing, how to produce exhausted glass tube with different metal for cathode and anode, how to manipulate cathode rays, and how to model what could be seen. So primitive low likeness of event is the underpinning foundations for the model robustness in perspectival ontology. There is no need for categorical properties, no need for dispositional properties, no need for cause of power, no need for capacities or all the other metaphysical paraphernalia. That doesn't make phenomena any less real though. If anything, it transforms the old ontological category of phenomena from uh, platonic shadows on the wall, if you, if you like, if you remember the myth in uh, Plato's Republic, into empowered phenomena in their own right. And therefore, the ontology and the realist of a realist aspect of perspectival realism uh, is really linked to this phenomena first ontology. The perspectival realist landscape that opens up in front of us is populated by morally robust phenomena, such as the bending of the cathode rays, or the decay of the Higgs boson, or the pollination of flowers, or the growth of mycelium, among many other examples. And most importantly, by rethinking realism along these lines, it's possible to give, I think, perspectivism its due role in knowledge production. One important consequence of this reconciliation is that the intersecting and interlacing of scientific perspectives really ground the possibility for the performance of a number of activities to function as expertise that can be trusted upon and relied upon. And this is the kind of expertise that epistemic community broadly understood, including a Bredian crofter, Yucatan beekeeper, can legitimately reclaim as their own alongside with plant morphologists, botanists, geneticists, cosmologists, and so forth. This move has also the further potential of contributing to ongoing debates in the human rights law and science policy on the right to science as an epistemic cultural right and realigning philosophical images of science and scientific knowledge production with important legal trends that have long recognized the importance of local communities and local expertise in matter concerning biodiversity and cultural rights. So I think philosophical narratives about epistemic diversity, like the one that I tell in the book, can be a tool in this process. And this is an area where I've been increasingly working in more recent times. 
So to conclude this, uh, um, this talk, I want to return one more time to Rongiri. At the start of his book on scientific perspectivism, Ron painted the historical context behind the rise of scientific pluralism in the 1960s and 70s as a motivation behind the book. So this is what Rongiri writes at the very beginning of the book. Quote, many who grew up after World War II found themselves horrified by the use of B-52s and other high-powered military technology against Vietnamese peasants riding bicycle and armed with little powerful than AK-47. Additionally, some women began to regard the new household technologies as more enslaving than liberating. Some people whose fundamental attitudes were formed during this period became university professors. And a few of these focused their attention on the sciences, not as scientists themselves, but as critics of science. Ron concluded chapter one of his book by summarizing his main intentions in developing a form of perspective of realism that is so as equidistant from both objectivist realism and social constructivism. So he wrote, if scientific knowledge is perspectival, scientific claims are neither as objective as objectivist realists think, nor as socially determined as even moderate constructivists often claim. In fact, my main arguments are directed at showing that perspective realism is as much realism as science can provide. That, I think, is a more secure ground on which to combat all pretenses to absolute knowledge, including those based on religion, political theory, or in some cases, science itself. Rona didn't live long enough to see the outcome of my um, thoughts on perspective of realism. And I don't know whether he would have agreed or not with the kind of realism I articulated in my book. But one thing I do hope, that by latching onto and by expanding Rongiri's notion of scientific perspective beyond the hierarchies of models, and by rethinking in broader terms the perspectival nature of scientific knowledge in a way that can be reclaimed by a myriad of epistemic communities and their situated practices, I do hope to have captured the spirit of epistemic humility that ultimately motivated Ron trailblazing work in this area. And with that, I want to thank you once again for inviting me to give this lecture. And I want to thank Ron Giri for providing us so much food for thought today has inspired me and I'm sure will continue to inspire many other people after me. Thank you. And this is the end of my talk. And I just acknowledge the funding body that in 2016-21, the European Research Council supported my research in this area. Thank you very much, Michaela. So now we move into a time of questions from you for Michaela. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand and I will run the mic to you. Uh, hi, Michaela. Um, thank you for giving this talk. I feel like I understand the book much better now that I've heard the talk. So it was, it was very valuable for me at least. Um, I was wondering about the claim, the, the sort of the contrast you were drawing with Kuhn. And part of this contrast is the thought that uh, what goes into a perspective includes the the glass blowers and the kelp makers and, and et cetera. And I, and I was wondering about that because I was thinking that, um, well, I, I was wondering if the Kuhnian couldn't sort of push back here and say something like, well, yes, that, that stuff's very important. To a large extent, it's black boxed. Um, so the scientist is very rarely going to know how their instruments are made and is often not going to need to um, because they can just say, well, I'm going to assume that they're made so that they work. Uh, and and I was wondering what you thought about that kind of that kind of thought, I guess, is, is how you might respond to that. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that uh, question. Um, so I guess what I was um, trying to do in the book by highlighting this plurality of communities, including um, communities that have 
um, sort of knowledge that might be called artisanal knowledge or experiential knowledge, um, as opposed to certified knowledge, to use the terminology by um, Collins and Evans, is the fact that um, there's a lot more to any scientific perspective than uh, than just the um, the modelers or the theoreticians, obviously, they are the, the artisans, the, the, the craftspeople, the people that do the instruments and so forth. Now, very often when we do science, we kind of bracket off the contribution of those communities because, well, just don't have time, history books will be too long, uh, and um, we can just focus on specific claims of knowledge about what there is, so I don't know, the electron or a uh, charge to mass ratio or whatever. Um, however, I felt it was important to stress when I talk about the historical and culturally situated nature of the knowledge, it's the situatedness of the knowledge that I think forces upon us a reassessment of uh, um, the uh, kind of view that we normally take when we write narratives about science and forces us to uh, zoom out of that and take into account the broader historical cultural context that made possible those searches to start with. Um, but linked to that, um, I also got interested in, in this aspect of, you know, what a scientific perspective could be if understood along these lines, because it strikes me that um, it is exactly what we often miss when we talk about epistemic injustice in science, um, when, uh, you know, we, we portray images or narratives about scientific knowledge and who produces and who ought to benefit from it, that very often don't give due credits to the wider historical, cultural, situated context and other communities in the context that really were instrumental to those discoveries. So I guess the short answer to your question is that, of course, I mean, if we are, you know, if we're studying electromagnetism, we're interested in how electrons behave in the presence of a magnetic field, that we don't need to tell a longer story about um, Ebridean kelp makers and the whole uh, industry of uh, making uh, uh, ashes of seaweed uh, that were important for glass manufacture or why uh, they happened in the context of the Napoleonic Wars that interrupted the import of glass from Germany and so forth. Uh, at the same time, I feel that having uh, the very notion of a situated perspective, which is, I guess, it's it's the kind of element that I was trying to add to the what I call the Kunyangirian picture intuitions at the beginning of the talk, is important for reassessing uh, uh, the, the contribution that different communities have given and also to, um, as I said, open the path to uh, a wider uh, conversation about whose knowledge, by whose light, and who ought to benefit from it. That seems to me the other important consequence that I was just hinting at at the very end of the talk. I, I have a question. I, I think it's about words. Mostly. Um, so I, I should say I haven't read your book. So if, if this is in there, uh, that would be useful to know. But I, I'm i I'm curious about the the motivation for hanging on to the term realism. I, I think I got some of this from the autobiographical remarks and that that last Geary line was helpful. Um, but I suppose like d during your talk, I ended up thinking of uh, Hasek Chang's water book where he's talking about a kind of realism and he gets kind of fighty about it. Like, Damn it! I'm going to call it realism because <laughs> this is enough realism. You know, like some sort of value in hanging on to that word. But I'm I'm curious what like specifically why you wanted to retain the term realism, uh, and why you didn't opt to call this some kind of third way between relativism and objectivist realism, and in, in, in the Geary sense. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think. Ron himself was uh, hanging on to the <laughs> terminology realism. So as uh, the, the, the slides from the 2014 symposium shows, he was really keen to uh, to talk about perspective realism as a, as a kind of third way between uh, what he called objectivist realism and some various forms of social constructivism. And, and I think there is a value in holding on to the terminology realism, uh, regardless of what one might think about how successful the whole enterprise is in uh, calling uh, these other varieties of 
uh, epistemic view realist in some sort, uh, so mine or as of Chang or Rongiri perspective of realism or whatever other view one might have in mind. Um, that terminology has a lot of baggage. So it, it tells us that, you know, there is a reason why we care about science. Uh, we care about science because um, science tells us a true story about nature. That's that's rough intuition that is behind realism. So if one wants to retain the value that scientific knowledge plays in understanding nature or well, the understanding, really gaining knowledge of nature, I think the term realism plays an important role. Um, and then the question becomes, OK, what counts as realism here? Should one necessarily be cornered into the scientific realist slash metaphysical realist view that the only way of making sense of the intuition is by assuming that there is a God that view, there are the best theories in mature science, and we have a story to tell about how those best theories in mature science map onto elements of reality. Many people, you know, back to Patnam internal realism and, you know, structural realists, selective realists, all sorts of real, local realists uh, have, I think, been resisting that uh, intuitions. And I think there is a reason why the, the term realism continues to exert its, uh, its, uh, its fascination because it, it, it carries up its sleeve the, the idea that there's a value in, in, in scientific knowledge. Um, and it's, it's the idea of value of scientific knowledge that I think we all want to try to hold on to and, and cash out maybe in different ways, in different forms. Hi, Michaela. Thank you for your talk. I found the later part where you spoke of science as human right of some kind very interesting, especially for local, small, situated epistemic communities. And I have a question about that. It looks like in the 21st century, there is another thing that drives science, which is money. And you need very large amount of money to do science, especially since it has to be done in big groups. And I see that it is bring some kind of danger to the smaller situated epistemic communities because they often do not have this access to this big money. So their inherited knowledge often becomes a business product of a larger community, which has very little connection to their inherited knowledge. And I think you know many, many examples of that. I give a quick example. Um, something that is used in all cosmetic industries, shea butter, and shea butter is produced in Africa, which used to be traditionally produced by women, definitely using techniques which they did at home. But this product is now done very large scale by companies, completely bypassing these epistemic communities. So how do you propose that people should respond or engage with the power of money and on the other hand, these ideal of local and situated knowledges. Thank you very much. I can't see your face. I'm afraid I think the camera is cutting you off. So I don't know who asked that question, but I think I understood the question exactly. And it's, it's a very important question. So this is something that I address in the final chapter of my book in chapter 11, where I discuss um, a number of uh, epistemic injustices that are at play in the narratives about science, where very often we precisely sever, cut off entirely the contribution of indigenous people and local communities in the process of scientific knowledge production. So you mentioned the she butter in the, in, in the book. I, I give other examples. So I, I go back to some examples about, I don't know, discovery of ink alkaloids for anti-cancer drugs, for example. Um, and so th this is the important question because the question is exactly when there are those power structure in place and the stark socioeconomic inequalities, um, those inequalities translate into inequalities at the epistemic level. So the injustice of cutting off the contributions of local communities and uh, they're often orally transmitted intergenerational knowledge 
is an injustice, which is the product of those dark socioeconomic injustices in which science plays out that you are referring to. I don't have a solution to the problem, but in chapter 11, I give a series of what I call um, normative pointers for how to avoid uh, those sort of epistemic injustices in the way we we tell philosophical narratives about science, in which we tell historical uh, narratives about science and so forth. And so I, I speak about the um, injustice of epistemic severing and epistemic trademarking, when sometimes we not only sever and cut off the contribution of a particular communities that tend to be underrepresented and marginalized, but also we tend to present the knowledge as the exclusive trademark of a particular uh, community that very often has uh, the um, technological know-how and the obviously the power structure to um, to produce particular pharmaceutical products or cosmetic products or whatever without taking into account this uh, historical interlacing of perspective uh, that is very often instrumental for scientific knowledge production. So yeah, what you're discussing is, is exactly something important, something that, as I said, I've been working more in uh, in more recent times because there are ramifications in all this uh, in, in the legal domains where people are discussing, for example, the right to science as a, as, a, as a right for everyone to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress. It's a, a human right. It was enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948, this is Article 27.1. Um, and uh, it's an article that is very difficult to implement until we have uh, uh, narratives about who produces scientific knowledge and what to benefit from it to that don't genuinely uh, apply or extend or recognize this plurality of ways of knowing. So it's a very important question. I think there's a lot more work that philosophers, I think, should be doing in this area. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. I, I'd like to uh, sort of build on a question that I heard a little before about, and you responded with sort of artisans and the nature of artisans and how one does science with respect to, you know, does a scientist really care where their tools come from? And and I sort of want to think about that with respect to artisanal science. So science wasn't always big science. So you had science that was basically the science was in some sense the labs themselves and this is still kind of the way occasionally their own small business they're artisans in of themselves and that's and so it, under those circumstances including the artisans is sort of natural right because of course they're part of the team but the way science works now is is largely well it's increasingly becoming divorced from that perspective and and I, and I kind of would be interested you know to think about, you know, really, is it really possible to to change it so that artisanal science is increase be becomes instead of rare, uh, dominant? Because that would that would get you around the problem of including the artisans in the in the science because they're all artisans doing the science, and some of them are in one aspect of doing the work, and others uh, in other aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Well, um, I guess. Um, one doesn't need to rewind the uh, the kind of tape of time and kind of go back to the timing where uh, most of the what the time were called the natural philosophers were effectively artisans themselves doing their experiment about chemistry of you know what the time was called natural philosophy in 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 their home uh, lab. But think of I don't know even large collaborations today is like at CERN, people that work on the Large Hadron Colliders. There's a lot of artisanal knowledge that is involved in uh, um, technical skills on how to make a calorimeter, how to build magnets, how to um, you know assemble the, the specific parts that enter into this sort of big science uh, kind of machinery. And very often, uh, even in the context, right? We, I mean, we don't have a system that um, recognizes or acknowledges the contribution of those communities. Ultimately, we have a system where, um, you know, prizes are given to the theoreticians that discover the particles rather than, uh, you know, the communities at large that have actually made those experimental discoveries possible. And very often, I think, um, 
even within those large sort of big science kind of experimental um, endeavors, right? That, that there is a genuine desire to acknowledge that those are collective achievements that are only possible because you have that plurality of communities that make uh, an incredibly sophisticated machine like the Atlas or the CMS at CERN possible. But our philosophical narratives very often uh, don't uh, necessarily talk about those communities. Our historical narratives don't necessarily do it either, um, and so forth. So it, it is an invitation just to consider, kind of step back and have a kind of zoom out view about what scientific knowledge is. And I, and I speak about scientific knowledge more than science, because very often the term science tend to be um, used in a way that can be exclusionary of other communities. So if we, if we, instead of science, we talk about scientific knowledge, I think we have a more malleable tool at our hand for capturing these varieties of way of knowing that intersect and interlace in, in various ways to, to produce reliable knowledge over time. So I don't know whether I've answered your question, but yes, I agree with you that obviously there's been a big change in the way in which science, especially big science is done today. But I think even within contemporary big science, there is a lots of example of artisanal knowledge, even without going to the specific examples about knowledge by indigenous people and local communities that very often um, is simply not reflected in our historical philosophical narratives about, about science or scientific achievements. Hi, um, I'd like to piggyback on all of that a little bit. Um, suppose a, a community doesn't have any concept of what the scientific world is doing. Um, have you wronged them? And I guess I want to bring up the idea of where, which is not so much artisan, which is also a little bit more scientific, uh, where scientists are trying to study trying to figure out how the barrier reef was formed, the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. And it turns out that the Aborigines had witnessed its formation. Now, why didn't they just go ask them? We don't know. Um, so obviously the, uh, and what ent what entails from there is like, how does, uh, how do reparations work then? Do you have an idea of how they might work or have we actually wronged them? That, okay. yeah. Great question again. Um, so the way in which in chapter 11 of my book I define um, epistemic severing is in the form of the act of um, either intentionally or unintentionally um, cutting off the contribution of particular communities. Um, so that can happen either when we do it with intention or it can happen just because we just don't know. Um, but it's still a form of, uh, uh, it's still a culpable form of epistemic injustice if we have a way of uh, ascertaining that there were other ways of knowing whatever the object of study was that we're not um, kind of recognizing in our, in our narratives. So how do we go about making uh, reparations? Well, we start by, for example, giving uh, epistemic agencies to those communities and start uh, treating them as epistemic communities in their own right. I think that's the first step. And so very often, uh, um, you know, there is a tendency, um, especially in some domains in, I don't know, botany or, or others to to think of the uh, knowledge of the local communities more as a form of custodianship rather than a genuine uh, epistemic uh, communities in their own right. So one thing I would say to start with is um, how we portray those ways of knowledge and not just as uh, some sort of stewardship or custodianship, but as something more substantive, as something that is effectively a form of knowledge making. So recognizing their status as epistemic communities, it seems to be the first step. And the reinstating the contribution of those communities into scientific narratives is the other, is the other step. And now, as I said, it may not be always the case if we are writing, I don't know, um, a short documentary and obviously for reason of um, 
time and expediency we need to kind of focus on the highlights but i think in general it's important for philosophers of science and for uh, historians of science to have the broader approach to scientific knowledge production where those communities are not um from the word go eliminated or uh, silenced or erased or just not acknowledged so that's that seems the first step but then obviously there are more substantive step because you know depending on the nature of the contribution uh you know there is entire there's a big literature contemporary literature in uh, obviously in uh, in in law in depending on what we're talking about in which area environmental laws and so forth about um access and benefit sharing uh, for uh, uh, knowledge that uh, has been contributed by those local communities as well so that's a big area in uh, i don't know local coastal communities for example uh, when it comes to ecological knowledge or uh, i don't know benefits uh, that result from all sorts of i don't know uh, uh, technological innovation or marine uh, science where those forms of local knowledge play a role. So it's part of a much wider conversation where I think the first step is to uh, give epistemic agencies to those communities and recognize them as uh, epistemic communities in their own right. That's the first step. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, one thing I was interested about was in your discussion between the relationship between phenomena and law-like um, events. So it seems the examples you use tend to be built in the area of the physical sciences, such as um, particle physics, um, and it seems to work really well for those. Um, sorry, I was holding it too far away. But um, so in a situation such as biology, um, in the biological sciences, it has often been argued that there are no actual biological laws, unlike in, say, physics. And I'm curious how you would see disciplines, for instance, such as ecology or evolutionary biology, fitting into the framework you describe in your talk. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we had this conversation in the center discussion group just before this lecture. So there were lots of questions on uh, on, on this point. So in uh, um, chapter five of my book, I make a distinction between laws of nature and law-like dependencies. So laws of nature are, I think, the sorts of things you have in mind, the things like Newton's law, laws of thermodynamics, um, Maxwell's equations, uh, the sort of things that physics is famous for. And very often I get asked that question, what about other fields that don't necessarily trade in laws of nature? Um, and that's why throughout the book, I really played emphasis on law-like dependencies because law-like dependencies are uh, features of what I call stable qualo-like events in nature that um, don't necessarily have to enjoy the status of a law of nature. Sometimes we don't even have names for them, but they don't appear within a system of laws a la David Lewis, uh, which is broadly what I'm what I'm having in mind here about what a law is. It's either an axiom or a theorem in a best system that uh, achieves the best combination of simplicity and strength. Um, we don't have those sort of laws in many areas from biology, biomedical sciences, uh, psychology, many other social and human sciences. However, um, it is a, a commitment of the sort of perspective of realism I defend in the book, that the world comes with law-like uh, events in the sense that those law-like dependencies for which we may have no name, we may have no theory, we may have no system um, of, uh, of, of laws, uh, are part of the fabric of nature. And I give other examples in the book. So an example is, um, as we were discussing before in the center discussion group, uh, the pollination peak, the phenomenon of pollination peak. It's a phenomenon uh, that is studied by um, pollination ecologists and uh, entomologists and, and plant morphologists and so forth. Um, and, and there are low-like dependencies that explain whether a plant would be pollinated depending on number of pollinators, number of pollen grains that get transferred and so forth. So those are broadly uh, the sort of low-like dependency that I have in mind when I um, when I talk about stable qualo-like events, uh, things that describe uh, the fabric of nature, the way things will be. They are in a way kind of irrespective of whether or not we have a name for them, whether or not we have a system of knowledge that uh, recognizes them as part of a system of laws and so forth. Uh, 
So I'll pop answer the question. Hi, Michaela. This is Ken Waters. I know you can't see us. No, and I can see you barely. Oh, you? Just about. Okay. Just about. Um, thanks for your talk. It was really good. I'm going to uh, try to do three things very quickly. One is uh, to portray an image I had in my head as you were giving your talk. The second is a mini speech, and the third is an actual question. So <laughs> the image that was in my head was an image of Ron. And uh, Ron, I, he had a certain kind of smile he would give. And he would have that smile when it was someone he influenced, like a former PhD student or postdoc who was doing something that he thought they're doing it really well, whether he agreed with them or not. And I was lucky and I experienced that smile sometimes. And I knew he was really proud of me, even though I might be saying something he disagreed with. And I just had this image of Ron with that kind of smile as, as you were talking. He would be very pleased with this. I, I know that. Uh, now for my mini speech, uh, I think one of the things Ron would like in your talk is you did something that I think uh, he didn't do so much, and that is... Uh, in your book, you situated perspectives histor historically, and um, Ron didn't do this so much in his work on science, but he did this on his work in philosophy. And so um, when people first started to uh, look at the history of philosophy of science in a serious way, looking at Carnap, there are two people leading the way. Alberta Coffa at Indiana, who was a colleague of Ron's, and Michael Friedman. Uh, and uh, when um, Coffa did that, he had come to Indiana, he wrote a dissertation on explanation, and he was so tired of Grunbaum's uh, red marks that he abandoned that work altogether, and he started looking at Carnap. And uh, Ron's original idea about this was that Alberta had abandoned philosophy of science. He was doing history of philosophy. And Ron didn't think this was valuable. Uh, but at that time, Ron was doing stuff on scientific inference. It was he had been influenced by von Frossen already. He was doing the, the, the modeling a bit. But the book, his first book, when he taught a seminar on an early draft of it, was entirely different. Uh, it would look like sort of stuff Deborah Mayo is doing. Um, but as Ron's views changed, and he disagreed with the way a lot of philosophers of science were doing philosophy, and especially the way a lot of philosophers were doing philosophy, he thought that doing history of philosophy was important to show that the ideas are situated, and that some people have an idea that this is essentially a philosophical idea or a philosophical problem. And uh, Ron was accused of not doing philosophical work. And he was trying to show that what you consider to be philosophical is comes out of the history you're a part of. And it could have gone otherwise. And he was interested in being um, reflexive himself. And one of the slides you showed towards the end, I think, gave a lot of his motivation for being a realist, and that was he wanted to defend science. And he saw um, uh, science under assault, and um, uh, he wanted to say that there was a relationship between those abstract models and the world of similarity and so forth. And he thought that, that was important. Uh, so now I'll get to my question. I apologize for giving a speech during the Q&A. Uh, my question is, Ron tried to be very reflective about his work. And so he recognized that his work was perspectival. And so I want to ask you about what perspective do you think you come from in your work? Uh, what, um, what might explain it? Um, or help us understand uh, your the point from which you've come. Well, thank you very much. I mean, you, yeah, you, this is uh, yeah, a wonderful 
wonderful comments about about Ron and about the way come, we came to to think about um, the old field of philosophy of science and doing the history of philosophy and um, in reply to your question, where where is is like my positionality answer? I I think I think you're asking me about my positionality and how I I got to engage with these questions that Ron originally um, asked and and from which vantage point I was approaching it. So I mentioned uh, some of the, obviously, the intellectual influences behind, um, behind the views, so obviously Ron to start with, but also people that along the way were critics of, of the view as some kind of relativist view, but also the influence of feminist uh, philosophy of science. But I guess there is a more autobiographical uh, element in my positionality that um, that probably I didn't realize myself when I got into the question about perspectivism, which is really the importance of local knowledge and local expertise as, a, as something that really mattered to me. And that it wasn't entirely clear to me when, you know, 10 years ago, now almost 14 years ago, I really started writing in this area. Um, but the particular angle I come to these questions is the question of, can we tell a story about, um, as I said, scientific knowledge more than science, that is not the usual story of uh, um, Western product of the global North, mostly uh, identifiable with a very specific historical period, with the scientific revolution and so forth. This is the way I was myself trained as a graduate student, right? I mean, that's that's, that's what we are told all the time. Um, and it was really in this idea of the situatedness of, of the perspective that somehow I rediscovered this other important aspect that um, I think it's 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 kind of there in Brown's work and his plea for pluralism really, um, uh, but maybe not quite at the level of uh, um, emphasis on local knowledge that I, I I try to give in the book and probably it's not even so much in the book but it's more in uh, um, in the work that I'm doing now after the book over the past two years. So when you finish a book, especially a book that has taken me a very, very long time to write, the question is, okay, well, what's next? And what are you planning to do next? And uh, so one of the, uh, I think, important elements that came out of this work on perspective of realism and really reflecting on uh, pluralism of perspective is the importance of local knowledge and the local uh, forms of expertise uh, that um, is something that I've been working more in in recent times. And it's something that, as I said, is autobiographical because I come from uh, a family of uh, people that um, were beekeepers, they were olive uh, olive oil producers and, uh, you know, that they, they didn't have a degree. <laughs> and uh, and so that, that kind of element of local knowledge, in a way, tells a lot about my own positionality in uh, in uh, in this whole uh, um, narrative about um, the perspective of natural scientific knowledge, I guess. Okay, we'll take one last question. How would you distinguish perspective from bias or perspective from context? Why wouldn't you use the word bias or context instead of perspective? Great. Um, I don't know what you mean by bias, but bias seems to seems to have negative connotations in a way that context doesn't. So I'm happy to say that a perspective is, uh, if you like, a contextualized um, body of knowledge. Um, so there is a lot that perspective of realism or perspectivism as an epistemic view shares with contextualism, for example. Um, bias is a different story, right? Because bias means, seems to suggest that one is unable to um, even produce anything that is reliable to start with. To be biased is, is, is the inability to um, look at things in a way that is... Um, somehow accurate and 
perspectives have nothing to do with biases because perspectives are situated and they simply mean there is no view from nowhere from which we can look at reality and uh, formulate claims of knowledge that are uh, um, valid always and everywhere. Our knowledge is every inch of the way contextual and situated in that sense. Does it mean it's biased? Um, the charitable reading that one could give is a sort of Van Frassian reading where the perspectivity of representation includes some sort of occlusion or omission. So we might, from a situated perspective, occlude or omit aspect of the um, phenomenon under study that um, might be visible only by endorsing a different perspective or by practicing a different modeling techniques and so forth. Um, but yeah, I don't know whether I've answered the question. So I see analogies with the idea of occlusion or the idea of omission that is very often associated with the perspectivity of the representation. Um, but there is nothing in the notion of bias itself that suggests any positive epistemic features of, uh, uh, of knowledge. Um, biases is a sort of negative things that should be avoided in a way that uh, the perspectivity of, of our knowledge is something that not only should not be avoided and cannot be avoided, but is actually what allows human beings like us to produce reliable knowledge over time. So the whole effort of the book was to try to show that despite being uh, situated and perspectival, we're still able to produce solid, reliable knowledge, hence the realist motivation behind the, the perspectival realism. So many of you might have encountered Michaela's work for the first time this afternoon. I want to highlight that her book is open access, it was published open access. So if you would like to follow up on some of the things that you heard this afternoon, you just need to search on perspectival realism, Oxford University Press, and you can download the PDF from there. Um, and uh, at this point, I think we've had a rich conversation, heard a lot of stimulating things from Michaela. Your questions have been provocative and helped extend that conversation further. So please join with me in thanking Michaela for her lecture. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you very much, all of you. As I said, and I'm really sorry that I cannot be there, but I hope you have a lovely reception after this. In memory of Ron, I would have been very happy about it.